Today I'm going to be talking to you about using the collisions of black holes to reveal the lives of stars. Now with any presentation, you're always supposed to build some kind of connection to the audience and um, foster some kind of connectivity to something that's typical in everyday life. When you do research in, in black holes, it's a little bit tough to really build those analogies, but I think I made the very obvious choice here. Now I'm not trying to say that cats are like black holes, that would be obscene. But cats and humans, and even astronomers, all have senses. These senses are the things that we're reliant on, the things that we depend to learn information about the world around us. And each one of them has their own benefits to us. Now, I want everybody to take a second to imagine what it would be like if we had a new sense, a new way to garner information from the world around us. In fact, later in the series of talks, one of the researchers is going to be telling you about a new sense that's a little bit more close to home. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be telling you about the senses that astronomers use to learn about the universe. And throughout all of history, astronomers have been reliant on one single sense to gather information from our universe, and that's the sense of sight. Since the early cavemen looked up into the sky and tried to understand why the things are moving the way that they are, to today where we use massive telescopes to gather photons from the distant universe, we've been relying on this one form of information to help learn about our place in this cosmic puzzle. Now I want you to think again, how much can we learn if we have a new sense to actually unveil the mysteries of the universe? To get a sense of uh, this new sense, I'm actually going to take us back to 1915. That man in the upper right is someone that you've probably seen before, Albert Einstein, and in 1915, he put together his theory of general relativity, a modern theory of gravity. Now, in this theory, space isn't a fixed background on which events occur, a cosmic stage, if you will. Rather, space bends and stretches in the presence of matter and energy itself. And said concisely by the physicist John Wheeler, space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to curve. Now, one of the byproducts of this theory if you have objects moving through this malleable fabric of space, then just like if you were dragging your finger through a bucket full of water, it would create ripples that emanate on the fabric of space itself. These ripples are called gravitational waves, and we've known about them since 1916. At least we've theorized their existence. But we haven't really had a way to detect these ripples. In fact, Einstein himself knew that these ripples had such a minuscule effect on the environment that they were passing through that they would be almost impossible to detect. But what effect do they actually have? These ripples in space-time aren't emitting any light for our telescopes to see. Rather, what they do is they change distances. They cause distances to expand and contract. Now, the amount that these ripples actually cause expansion and contraction is unbelievably minuscule. So what you would need to do to be able to detect these ripples and to use them to learn about our universe is to design a very, very precise ruler. How precise of a ruler do we need to detect these ripples? Take your two run-of-the-mill black holes. If they collided and emanated some of these ripples in space-time, the change in distance would be so unbelievably small that you would need a ruler that would be able to measure a change in distance, the width of an atom, if it, the ruler itself were the distance between the sun and the earth. So you need to measure the distance of an atom for a ruler that's as big as the distance between the earth and the sun. Sounds impossible. Einstein thought it was impossible. But just last year, we actually made the first observation of these gravitational waves. Our rulers, situated in Livingston, Louisiana, and Hanford, Washington, each two and a half miles long, were able to sense this tiny, tiny change in distance that came from colliding black holes a billion light years away. Now, with this signal itself, we can tell lots of things about the system that generated, such as how far away it was. But we can also tell how big these black holes were, how fast they were actually moving. And just from this signal, we can reconstruct a realistic visualization of what this collision would have looked like if we were sitting right at its doorstep. And that's what this simulation right here is showing you. Now these black holes, each of them was about 30 times the mass of the sun. And these objects are so densely compacted that they really alter the path that light travels for coming from behind them, an effect called gravitational lensing. Now one thing that amazes me with this collision, throughout this process, 
So much energy was put into the ripples in space and time that if you were to capture all this energy and use it to power a light bulb, that light bulb would have outshone all of the stars in the universe. But this event isn't emitting any light whatsoever. All that energy is in the space itself. It doesn't emit any light for our traditional telescopes to see. Now also, this video, other than being slightly choppy, is very much slowed down. This whole event, the whole data stream that you see on the bottom there, actually occurred over about a fifth of a second. Something a little bit more like this. So how can we take these last words of this system and use it to actually infer properties about the objects that permeate our universe. That's the research that I particularly am interested in. Taking this signal, this new sense that we have for our universe, and using it to learn about the evolution of stars, the environments that form black holes and in which stars evolve in, and even the processes that affect the deaths of stars, like supernovae themselves. So how do we do this? We turn to simulations. This right here is actually looking at a simulation done of one of these dynamical environments, something called a globular cluster. And by pairing the detections of gravitational waves with the output of these simulations and throwing in a dash of some statistics, we can actually start to infer the physical processes that are underlying the objects that make up this simulation itself. One route that we can actually go, rather than just looking at how big these black holes are that we're detecting, is looking at how they're spinning. Both theory and observation tell us that black holes have a spin associated with them as well. And it turns out that the different processes that evolve to form these black holes and the different environments in which these black holes form greatly affect the way that these black holes are spinning. The spins of those black holes then show themselves in the waveforms that we detect with our gravitational wave detectors. So by pairing this new way of observing our universe, with our simulations, we can start to infer a lot of the properties that underlie stellar evolution and the formation channels for forming these binary black hole systems. But besides using these gravitational waves to illuminate the lives of stars, we can undoubtedly look forward to this new sense enticing question that we didn't even think to ask in the first place. And it's these unknown unknowns that I am the most excited about in the future and will undoubtedly fuel the minds of curious scientists for years to come. Thank you.